she's the favor of the Lord's really on her right now, and the Lord has really been promoting her. And I'm so excited about her. One of the most uh, profoundly accurate prophets in our environment, maybe in any environment I've ever experienced. And Haley has a uh, very special, you know, the way she connects. And I always think about connections like sometimes, you know, you get a plug and you plug into 220. And if, it, you know, maybe anything about electricity, there's a lot of different ways to configurations of that plug. And I think the way we plug into the Lord is he's, he's so amazing. He has so many ways he connects and communicates with us. Haley has a, a really special connection in the way she connects in that she has these profound encounters that sometimes go on for days and uh, actually one that went on for six weeks. And uh, we'll just jump right in. You just wrote a book called Surrender to the Holy Spirit. First of all, like the title's intriguing. Uh, what do you mean by that? Because people mean different things by this. You know, language in this church is not common, right? We, in one environment, that would mean one thing. In another environment, that would be another. Why did you call it Surrender to the Holy Spirit? What did you mean by that? Yeah. And what, what's the book about? Yeah, so the book is about a the a six week encounter that I had with the Holy Spirit met me after I had received a prophetic word king of the fear of man uh, in my life, and um, when I received that word three months before, I uh, I had become to realize receiving that word. You know, you sometimes you receive prophetic words and you're saying yes in the process. Yeah. But when I'm lying on the floor, I'm thinking. God, you and me know that I've done my best to step over the chicken line when it comes to the fear of man, but we know that I'm tormented by a voice that says that I'm not good enough and that I need to be adjusting myself all the time. And so um, I got to the end of my rope, really, and I surrendered my shield of the fear of man to receive the Lord as my shield. And in return, in return, the, the Lord met me in such a powerful and profound way. But I began to realize that it wasn't through my striving that the Lord changed and transformed my life. It was being surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And it's funny, we even went back and forth in the title. Uh, the publisher had said surrender. And I said, no, I want it to be surrendered because I don't feel like you can demand surrender. You have to choose to be surrendered. And so that's why it's surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I'm glad you changed the title because I think of putting my hands up every time I hear the word surrender. And I'm like, uh, okay, next you're going to read me the rights. <laughs> you had a six-week encounter, and it kind of typifies your the way you connect with the Lord. And I think you and I are in, very different, right, in our well, our, our approaches to ministry and our personalities, especially in the spirit. And uh, I have very few quote encounters, and you know, they're they've kind of become the hallmark of your uh life in god so it's it's really powerful because we have people that will be on this um on this instagram that will be you know more like me and some more like you why do you think encounters are important i i, I mean i, I want to like i'd like you to you know answer that question in light of a lot of people haven't had an account any encounter at all so it would be good for you to describe the encounter and then why do you think that's important for you? And then we can talk, talk a little bit about how about people who don't, you know, they don't experience the Lord like that. Yeah. Is there, is there some, is there something wrong with them or cause you know, I, I would be them. So why don't you uh, start by describing uh, what do you mean by an encounter? Yeah. Well, firstly, I think that's one of the biggest issues is what do we mean by an encounter? Reading the Bible can be an encounter. Uh, the Lord speaking to me when I wake up in the morning through an impression can be an encounter. And I think uh, to really first just say that I don't believe an encounter is just something that is outwardly uh, demonstrative, but I think it's an inward shift. I think the mark of the Lord speaking to us and touching us is he changes things that we cannot alter ourselves. And so I think, you know, I didn't used to be the big encounter person. In fact, when I came to first year, I was quite offended by people that were encountering the Lord. I, I felt like it didn't make sense to me or, you know, these drunk people, I was just, they kind of, you know, when everyone else is drunk and you're not, it's kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> exactly. And so, uh, and I used to say, you don't, 
I don't think you, God will give you an encounter if you need one. I don't know if you need an encounter to do what God's called you to do. And, um, but I do think sometimes you do. And I think that's the thing is that we all have an encounter available to us through the word in worship. God is available. He speaks. He, our, he says, my sheep know my voice. He's always speaking. But there's an element where I, I needed a radical shaking i shook for six weeks violently under the power of god it wasn't pretty it wasn't um dignified but i think for the fear of man to die in me i i had to lose part of my dignity and surrender to the lord and i think god gives you the encounter you need and i think i needed that and maybe i needed to be violently shook i'm a fighter i don't give up easily i like to work for what i get i uh, grace for me has been something I've really had to work to just receive. And so I think the Lord bypassed my ability and showed me his ability, which was so much greater than my own. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was with you in your encounter. Well, you were in it for six weeks. So I experienced you when you were shaking physically. By the way, we should say she was physically shaking. Yeah. And, and uh, I experienced you as quite emotional at the time yes weeping often and still came to our meetings often and most of the time and was kind of a uh a holy spirit mess in the meeting and, and uh that that encounter lasted like day and night for six weeks if i remember correctly right and so yeah you know i see lots of people over the years that have encounters similarly you know like some kind of physical manifestation that lasts anywhere from a few minutes to days, uh, weeks, months. And sometimes people have these encounters and they don't change. Like there's no change. How would you address that? Because I, I know, you know, it's not on the list here to talk about, but I, I, I struggle with people who have encounters and who are just as nasty after their encounter as they were before. And I'm like, well, you think when Holy Spirit comes on you that you would have an inward, you know, you, you're having an, in, an inward experience that would have an outward new expression. Um, but that, that's not always true, unfortunately. W what do you think about that, Haley? I know we didn't talk about this answer, so just that's, interesting. That's, word, but. It's a great question. I, I write about it in my book, actually. Oh, wow. You know, Matthew, wow. Matthew 13 talks about the parable of the sower and seed that is sown and i believe that an encounter is like uh, eating a piece of fruit and i um, encounter i'm saying prophetic word a uh, moment where god speaks to you while you're reading the word of god a uh, uh, way that the lord speaks to you a violent shaking anything where god meets you i believe it's like a piece of fruit right in the moment it feeds you so if i eat an apple it feeds me it tastes good it's an amazing experience but at the core of that fruit is what seed and at the core of that fruit, I, ha I get to choose whether that moment becomes an invitation to growing the same seed that was just I experienced, love, patience, peace, joy, kindness, yeah. goodness, gentleness. Yeah. That, and I think a lot of times people have a moment with the Lord that feeds them for a moment. But what they don't realize is the work actually begins after that. And that is the true work of an encounter is actually an invitation to becoming more like God, an invitation to growing the seed of the kingdom in your life. And I've spent the last three and a half years stewarding that one encounter of six weeks. And I'm still learning to this day what the Lord showed me and made available to me. And it is constantly changing me and transforming me and challenging me. But I have to lean in and let the soil of my heart be humble and hungry enough to let one moment with the Lord expand my capacity to be to live that out. Because you see, if I don't put the seed in my life, I have to go back to someone else that has apples every time. And what I want to do is I want to become a person that is growing apple trees in my life, that I become a resource to the people around me, a resource of generosity, a resource of love, a resource of the kingdom, that I'm not just someone that eats and experiences, but I also... And now I'm experiencing and I'm letting it change me, apprehending it for myself, that I can become a resource to the people that are broken and needy and hungry around me. That's really powerful. And 
That, I, I've never heard that analogy, actually. I, maybe you've taught it here, but I've never heard it. Yeah, you can eat the apple and you're, you know, you're hungry two hours later. But, you know, metaphorically, if you eat the seed, you're going to be growing something powerful in you. And I think it's really a great illustration that some people are experiencing the apple, but they actually don't grow anything new in their lives. And it's, it's kind of sad because in every apple is the seed, right? In every apple, there is the ability to grow something new, but it doesn't mean that you actually will. What, what yeah, you, I mean, in, yeah, go ahead. In, in Matthew, yeah, in Matthew 13, Jesus pauses the parable before he explains it, and he says, he talks about having ears but hearing nothing and having eyes but not seeing. And I think we have to have eyes and ears and hearts that are hungry to perceive that what the Spirit is saying, not just to have experience. And you know in a marriage, you don't just live in a marriage to have an experience. You live in a marriage, it's sacrificial, it's, it's um, giving of self, it requires more of us often than we feel like we have to give but the fruit is so rewarding and i i think encounters are only an invitation they're an invitation to intimacy with the lord and that is where real fruit is is produced moving on from that uh how do you uh what do you you know like specifically how do you position yourself to partner with the holy spirit like you know like what i'm actually looking for is something practical and not kind of mystical and elusive yeah like how how would you say like for instance i'm sitting on this phone on this call today and i've never had an encounter i love the lord i've never had an encounter uh, a spiritual encounter in, in any way that i that i recognize and i i would lo love to have an encounter is there something that i can do to position myself to increase the likelihood of an encounter in my life. Well, so, yeah, it makes sense. I, what I find hard sometimes is I, I feel like I watch you encounter the Lord. I was just on a recording with you last week and I watch your heart soft as you talk about uh, what the Lord is speaking to you as a senior prophet in our house from a young prophet's point of view. And I see your heart soft and I see yeah. tears and I think, for me, the first thing I'd want to say to anyone listening that maybe feels the way that you do is the softness of our hearts towards the Lord and our ability to adjust to his voice and to what he's saying is really what positions us to being transformed. And we're not having encounters so that we can share a good story so that people can think we're awesome. We're having encounters Absolutely. so that we, we can be changed. And the evidence of your life, Chris, is a life that is molded and shaped by the Lord. And the fruit of your life is one that is evidence of the work of the Spirit. And so I would say to anyone listening right now, that is like, how do I position myself for that? I, I would say have a soft heart and let the fruit of your life be that the fruit of the Spirit. And God will meet you the way he needs to meet you. And he will, if, if you're hungry, you know, being good soil is being a hungry, humble person. And I think there are times where we can become callous or dilute, disillusioned because we've had a lot of experience with people in the church. We've had disappointment, we've had pain. And I think it's constantly inviting the Lord into those places and saying, God, if there's any place in my heart that is, um, that is disillusioned or disqualified myself, I invite you to come. Um, but I think real encounters don't happen with eyes on our lack. You know, I heard a teaching recently that there's a difference between solitude and isolation. Because in isolation, we look at ourselves and our lack. And solitude is actually where I separate myself from the noise of the world to lean into what the voice of God is saying. And I think that that's what I would say is to be, be certain that when we're drawing away, that we're not drawing away to try and earn our way into the love of God or earn our way into receiving something. But we're drawing away to receive his love, not to look at our lack. And so those are some of the practical things that say, take your eyes off of what you're not and realize that he is everything that you will ever need. And he wants to be that. And, um, and then just the encouragement that I think we're having more encounters than we think. And sometimes our encounters are progressive instead of one big moment and to look at the fruit of our lives instead of just one uh, outward manifestation the truth, I, I mean, I, I say this gently, but um, I'm trying to think how to say this well. 
uh, intimacy in marriage, you can do the mechanics of intimacy and still have a, a pinnacle moment without having true connection. And uh, God isn't looking for some big moment in your life. He's looking for true connection. And I think if that's what your life is uh, exhibiting and that's what you're giving yourself to, that is exactly what he's hoping for. Yeah, uh, that's so good. You know, I want to encourage people that are on the call. Uh, the School of Prophets this year is the August 7th through the 11th. Like, it's four and a half days. And one of the things that, as a team, that we have proactively are going after this year is encounters. Why, why we're actually talking about encounters. Because we, as a team, we want to teach, we want to prophesy, and we, we want to, you know, we want to have activations. We want you to be connected and find some uh, fellow friends who are, you know, prophetic and prophets. We want to create a place for you to belong. We want to create a place for you to be known. But one of the things that our whole team has talked about this year in our last few months preparation for coming up on August, August uh, 7th is we really want encounters we really want to go after encounters. And Haley, it's you, you and Dano are the, uh, I think the two that are really leading the charge on that portion of it. Like we want to make sure that people do have, do experience encounters and that they, you know, that they, they, they uh, prepare themselves for that. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, if you ask me about how do you have an encounter, I would tell you, I know how to make sure you don't have an encounter that's like be bitter be self-willed you know um uh don't be transparent don't be humble you know be arrogant like those are all the things those are those are things that will guarantee that we don't have encounters yeah so um yeah so we're pretty excited about this year school of the prophets i think we're gonna have some a real different feel um, some of our teams are going to take uh, the, the forefront this year, which I think is beautiful because we're doing, we're not doing succession planning, but we are doing inclusion planning where Dan and I are saying to our teams that have been with us a long time, Hey guys, step up and take an extra session and let's, uh, let's make this something new and beautiful. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's great. I, I mean, I, I really believe that God is going to encounter people in a powerful and a profound way. Because, you know, when Peter encountered the Lord in Acts 2, he went from being a man that denied Christ in right before, prior to Acts, to the outpouring of the Spirit. He denied Christ. And then all of a sudden, God grabs a hold of his life. And in the face of the same persecution, Peter cries out for boldness. His prayer is, God, make me more bold. And um, I, I really believe, you know, as we've been talking about as a team, I really believe that the Lord is wanting to put courage in people. He's wanting to break the fear of yeah. man off of a generation and put courage um, courage in us as prophets, as people who are declaring the word of the Lord. Well, yeah, I, I believe that's true, too. And I, I think that it's going to be an extraordinary year. I, 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 really, uh, I really have been feeling like there needs to be uh, uh, maybe I'll call it an uprising in the Generation Z. You know, um, I think that there is Gen Zs. I, I believe there's a prophetic movement among Gen Zs. I think that part of what we're supposed to do as mothers and fathers in this movement is to actually infuse Gen Zs with the power of the Lord and really just begin to call them out, call them up. Uh, equip them. Uh, I feel like Generation Z is has the highest rate of suicide in the history of America, and I think that we need prophets and prophetic people to actually rise up in this whole Jezebel kind of demonic spirit that's taking out our young people needs to be um, halted, but more turned around. And I feel like the enemy's trying to take out a generation because he knows that there is a Moses in that generation. There's a really there's a there is a redeemer in that generation, and so we're excited about the empowering of this next generation. And I think that uh, one of the things I really want to encourage uh, those of you that are watching this is that you should send your sons and daughters, like you know, 15 year olds, 16 year olds, like we really need this generation 
to be powerful because the the dark side is really powerful and you you can't you can't have victory when you refuse or when you don't pick up the weapons of warfare that aren't carnal so um I really want to encourage young people to come to the School of Prophets this year, especially. I think we're going to have something special for that generation, for every generation, but for that generation. And I really think that we are going to help connect the generations. And I feel like that's a big part of, you know, the call of God in our lives. So it's going to be profound and powerful this year. Uh, Haley, you have any last thoughts or words that you, you want to share before we exit this call? I actually had a quick question for you. Is oh, that okay? Sure, sure. You know, I feel like the school of the prophets is different from our prophetic country to raise up prophets. But I would love to hear from you why you feel like prophets need to rise in this season and what prophets actually do functionally um, in seasons like we're in uh, and your kind of your heart to train and equip them. Well, I think that, you know, when I look at, when I read the scriptures, Old and New Testament, well, I see that every time the Lord wants to shift a culture, whenever he wants to shift a city, whenever he wants to shift a nation, the very first thing he does is he inspires the prophets to and, and invites them into that space. So you had Abraham was a prophet. You had Moses. We all know the story of Moses who's a prophet. You have Elijah who's a prophet. Elisha who's a prophet. You have Daniel, jo Joseph, and Esther. You know, you have all of these prophetic people who God, when God wanted to change Babylon, he doesn't send an army, he sends a prophet. When he wants to change Persia, he doesn't, change, he doesn't send an army, he sends a prophet. When he wants to shift uh, the Israelites out of slavery and into freedom, he doesn't send an army, he sends Moses the prophet. And, you know, when he wants to, you know, uh, overthrow wicked Jezebel and Ahab, who are, you know, polluting the, the Israelites with uh, the worship of Baal, he doesn't send an army, he sends a prophet. And then we have the new covenant, and you're like, okay, well, that's an old covenant kind of picture. And I do agree what the prophets were doing in the Old Testament was, even, you know, they were anointed to shift culture, but they certainly did not mostly do it out of love, it's mostly out of fear. But the new covenant, we have, you know, the, we have the uh, 120, in the, in the upper room praying and you know and, and then the Holy Spirit uh, falls on them now they're, they're they're commanded don't go into the world don't go into Jerusalem to receive what the Father has promised so they, 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 the Lord's like listen I want to shift culture but you aren't ready to shift it they pray 40 days after the resurrection Holy Spirit falls on them and the first First thing that happens is that Peter stands up and he said, "This is what the prophet Joel spoke of in the last days. I'm sending a lot. I'm sorry. In the last days, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even upon your bond servants, in those days, will I pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy." Four times Peter says in the very first outpouring, he says, "I'm gonna send. I'm, I, I, I'm using, the sons are gonna prophesy." The daughters are going to prophesy. The old men are going to prophesy. The young men are going to prophesy. And even your bond servants, like, doesn't have a social class, doesn't have a gender, it doesn't have a generation. And, and, and what is the, when the Lord wants to shift culture, what's he doing? He goes, this time I'm not going to send a prophet. I'm going to send a whole prophetic movement. And I'm going to shift the entire world towards the kingdom. And here's the outcry of that. The most profound person to ever impact culture in the history of the world then this is viewed by every secular and uh christian um what am i trying to say uh surveys jesus christ is the number one person who's been the biggest influence not just in america in all over the world every single survey even secular surveys put jesus christ at the top as the most influential person in the history of the world. Wow. And there's been some pretty influential person, people. Jesus didn't have a phone. He didn't have internet. Didn't, he didn't have a plane, jet, or, or a car. He didn't have any of the amenities. He didn't have Instagram, social pages, anything like that. He only 
actually ministered for three and a half years publicly. And, and but what he did was he released, when he left, he released this Holy Spirit who carried out his work among men and they shifted culture largely through a prophetic movement. That's it. And so I believe that the Lord is in the midst of shifting a culture. We are in a cultural war. We know that. We're not in a war with humans, but we are in a war with the principality of the air. And uh, we have weapons that aren't carnal. So we have, you know, we have, we have highly trained uh, 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 people who have very unique warfare skills to see this principality come down and to see an establishment of a form of government that acknowledges the king and his kingdom. So that's what I see. I think that's going to be a very unique part of uh, the gathering. This yeah. The part. And I think, uh, you know, I've been beating that drum for a little while. So I'm like shifting culture. Come on, guys. Yeah. We are, we are more than conquerors we are we are we've got the armor of god we are prepared for darkness we are light we th we actually thrive in darkness we're actually we don't just survive in dark we're actually created for darkness and so uh i'm very excited this year to hand out a bunch of equipment and see people uh be cultural catalysts and uh and solutionaries yeah yeah, I think I just to add to that, I think that's exactly why we're pursuing encounters this year is because I, I had an encounter with the Lord in the night a couple nights ago where I saw Jesus grabbing a hold of us as we grabbed a hold of the mandates that he was giving us. And I think a, a people like that, a prophetic people gripped by God who have gripped a hold of what the Lord cares about. Those are people that shift culture. And I, I just had a sense um, as we close that there might be some people watching this who think that they're not born to shift culture, that they're not, you know, they're not a prophet or they're maybe not prophetic enough. And I just I just feel really clearly in First Corinthians 14, it says, you know, earnestly seek the gifts, but above all, seek to prophesy. And that is because the prophetic brings the heart of God to earth. It brings shift. It brings the, the mind of Christ into the reality of the people that are around us. And what you're sharing, Chris, I think so both you and I could have a million reasons why the Lord shouldn't have picked us. We could tell you about our Sorry. educational background um, and we could talk to you about all the reasons why we, we aren't the perfect fit, but a life gripped by God who grabs a hold of what he has for them impossibilities go and i just want to prophesy over everyone here today like the lord is calling you by name if you are breathing he has called you for such a time as this and the lord is longing to grab a hold of a people who want to grab a hold of him and i believe even beyond our school the lord is about to pour out his spirit on the church in such a marked and amazing way and uh i'm excited to be in the room this year and i pray that the lord grabs a hold of me again I'm always hungry, always ready, and so grateful for the room and the place that you've stewarded, Chris, and, and excited for what God's doing in our midst, but more than that, what he's about to do in the world uh, to bring shift through the church. That's beautiful. Well, August uh, 7th through 11th, um, we're, I think we'll put a link in the, in the chat, so it'll be super easy. You just click on there. Um, you can join us online. By the way, online's not gonna just be like, you know, a YouTube teaching. You're going to have encounter rooms. You're going to be in a in a revival group. You're going to have a community. Um, there's going to be interaction. There'll be prophecy over you. There'll be uh, there'll be um, uh, activations for you to learn how to move more deeply in prophecy. So it's going to be powerful and profound. Join us. Have a lot of, uh, a lot of fun. Haley, thanks so much for joining me. Love you guys, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Chris. So good to be with you all. Bye now.